on this edition of Sightings. Classified government documents called Majestic 12 could link the White House, the CIA, and the Congress to a conspiracy that has kept extraterrestrial contact a secret. The Majestic 12 documents tell a simple story about the recovery of a crashed flying saucer, alien bodies. How long can the secret be kept? Secrecy is not designed to keep the enemy from knowing. It's designed to keep the people from knowing. Then, Teresa Carlson died mysteriously. Now, a psychic detective offers a startling vision of what happened. I saw a very mousy-looking man. Plus, did a special psychic bond with animals save this man's life? Dogs truly can tell when something's about to occur. Later, a legendary entity is captured on film, and a mystery sound in Taos, New Mexico, is forcing people to leave. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. The United States Air Force admits that between 1952 and 1969, they conducted a secret study called Project Blue Book. Its purpose was to determine if UFOs posed a real threat to the American people. Project Blue Book concluded that they did not, and since 1969, the Pentagon has denied participating in any other UFO study. But ufologists believe this is a lie that secret projects with names like Moondust, Ozma, and Aquarius continue to this day. Does the United States government know more about these UFOs than they're telling us? Are top secret projects withholding information from the American people? There is mounting evidence that UFOs are considered a serious threat to our political and military stability. Sightings has investigated thousands of pages of documents, all written by government employees all on the subject of UFOs. And there are charges that this is just the tip of the extraterrestrial iceberg, that what we are entitled to see through the Freedom of Information Act is only a fraction of the incendiary material this country is hiding. Secrecy is not designed to keep the enemy from knowing. It's designed to keep the people from knowing. Victor Marchetti knows firsthand just how far the government will go to keep its darkest secrets. For nearly 20 years, he worked at the CIA, specializing in clandestine operations. Later, he revealed many of the CIA's secrets in a book the company tried to stop. When the people know what's going on, then that's when you have trouble if you're in a position of authority. There is no dispute. The government can and does keep its secrets well. But why would it choose to draw the veil of secrecy around UFOs? What does the government know about UFOs that it doesn't want to share with the public? A panel of experts convened by the CIA concluded that UFOs could be a threat. According to Knapp, that panel convened in the early 1950s and laid out a top secret plan to infiltrate and discredit UFO investigators. It came in response to the continuing uproar over the UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico, a crash the military initially said was caused by a flying saucer. That claim was later retracted. Knapp and others believe that the pattern of cover-up and disinformation in Roswell became standard operating procedure. Beginning in 1953, these top secret projects were allegedly given names. Saucer, Red Light, Grudge, Magnet, Snowbird, all with different functions, but all with the same agenda. This is being visited by aliens uh, from outer space. Obviously, the United States government would have a great interest in this. But the only UFO project that the government has ever publicly acknowledged is Project Blue Book, which was in operation until 1969. What they did was to investigate something that was a potential threat to our national security. Colonel Robert Friend directed Project Blue Book for four years. In a rare interview, I asked him about the true purpose of the project. Some people believe that Project Blue Book is part of a massive, was part of a massive government cover-up in order to avoid people getting too excited about UFOs. 
Well, if it was, he was very successful because he covered it up from me, too. Do you believe that the Earth has ever been visited by craft and or beings from somewhere else? I say no. Those of us who really dug into it know that Blue Book was a cover. Many ufologists believe Blue Book was instituted to deflect attention away from a super secret task force called Majestic or MJ-12. 12 experts who illegally bypassed Congress and reported directly to the White House about potential UFO threats. Majestic 12 is the name given to a committee allegedly established under President Truman in 1947 following the apparent retrieval of an alien vehicle and bodies in the New Mexican desert. We know about Majestic 12 because of this, a 1954 memo from Robert Cutler, special assistant to President Eisenhower, alerting General Nathan Twining to an upcoming MJ-12 meeting. The document is in the National Archives, but the government insists it is a fake. The Majestic 12 documents, if genuine, are of course the most important ones ever leaked to the American public because they tell a simple story about the recovery of a crashed flying saucer, alien bodies, the establishment of a group Operation Majestic 12, accountable only to the President of the United States, including an all-star cast of 12, the first three directors of Central Intelligence, first Secretary of Defense, outstanding scientists. If genuine, they're really super important. And MJ-12 was only the domestic branch of a worldwide secret UFO investigation, according to former NATO Command Sergeant Major Bob Dean. Frankly, it's probably the most sensitive document that NATO has ever been involved with. Dean was assigned to NATO Supreme Headquarters Command. He claims to have had NATO's highest security clearance and to have seen a NATO UFO report called The Assessment. It was while I was there from 1963 to 1967 that I learned about a NATO study that had been begun in 1961. And in 1964, when they published the study, and I had a chance to really look at it and study it, I have to be honest with you and tell you that that information literally changed my life because I knew for the first time that this the subject was not fantasy it wasn't myth wasn't legend it was real it was true they concluded apparently the evidence was overwhelming that the planet and the human race had apparently been under some kind of a survey or analysis or study for a very long time by several high technology extraterrestrial civilizations. The assessment has never been released to the public. However, the same language that Bob Dean claims to have read during his tenure at NATO is also contained within this document, an Air Force training manual obtained by sightings. Here is an excerpt from the paragraph heading Alien Visitors. The most stimulating theory for us is that the UFOs are material objects which are either manned or remote controlled by beings who are alien to this planet. To date, these intelligence agencies have denied any interest in UFOs beyond Project Blue Book. If this is true, why have thousands of pages of UFO documents been obtained through the Freedom of Information Act? All those agencies, with the exception of the Air Force, denied any serious interest in UFO research. Suddenly they come out with thousands of pages of documents, and more and more have been released. But page after page is virtually blacked out. What are they hiding? Incontrovertible proof that there are uh, people from outer space who are more intelligent than we are and uh, different than we are from us and are here would, uh, would undercut many of the institutions in which our civilization is built. And to those who say that we have been visited, that the government knows we've been visited, and the government is covering it up for reasons we may not understand, you say what? I'd say that uh, it would be the best kept secret in the world because uh, I certainly don't know anything about it. People will deal with this. People can handle this. And it's time to tell them the truth. The Roswell incident in New Mexico was the springboard that launched modern interest in UFOs and the persistent charge that the government knows more than they're telling us. Is there a Roswell conspiracy and cover-up? The arguments on both sides are convincing, 
as you'll discover when Sightings continues. Next, a half century later, two renowned experts return to the Roswell UFO crash site in search of answers. There were bodies there, strange bodies. But that, that's a red herring. Did an alien spacecraft crash near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947? Well, a just published report from the U.S. Air Force says no. That report contradicts ufologists who believe that Roswell is a government conspiracy of the highest order. Well, now Sightings has brought together former State Department official Carl Flock and world-renowned ufologist Stanton Friedman to debate their polar views so that you can judge for yourself. July 3rd, 1947, Roswell, New Mexico. The time and the place of the most significant UFO event in history. Mac Brazel and his daughter Dee find that something has crashed on their sheep ranch. But what crashed remains a mystery, fiercely debated for more than 50 years. Roswell has been investigated, dissected, and reconstructed in the press, in top secret military reports, and even in a television movie titled Roswell. July 8th, the official government version of the incident released to the press. The UFO was a weather balloon. For 50 years, the military has maintained that no further explanation is necessary, but significant questions remain. First, what were the size, shape, and overall dimensions of the craft? Second, what was the craft made out of? What materials were recovered? Third, were bodies collected at the site? And were those bodies human? And finally, is the government hiding the truth about the extraterrestrial origin of those bodies? Sightings has brought together two world-renowned Roswell experts to debate their opposing views on the Roswell incident. Stanton Friedman is a physicist who has developed nuclear rocket technology for the space program. He has lectured on UFO phenomena since 1967. Roswell is important because it set the tone for what the government did and knew. I mean, that was 1947. It's important because it's proof that we're part of a galactic neighborhood. Aliens are coming here. Carl Flock is a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and CIA intelligence officer. He agrees with Friedman that there was a crash and a cover-up, but does not believe the incident was the result of extraterrestrial visitation. Flock's recently published study on the incident is titled Roswell in Perspective. I was not convinced one way or the other about the extraterrestrial element or precisely what was involved. The only thing I was sure of, or, or reasonably sure of, was that the official explanation uh, of, of it being a weather balloon and a radar target misidentified was nonsense. Flock and Friedman agreed to meet near the site of the historic Roswell crash. The debate begins. I think after all these years of looking into this, that what really happened was that two saucers were winging their way along in New Mexico, ran into some kind of a problem, maybe a radar beam, maybe a lightning bolt, something like that, had a mid-air collision, and that most of the pieces of wreckage came down on the Brazel Ranch. All we can really say for sure is that Mac Brazel found something extremely unusual on that ranch. I think, frankly, that, that most of the testimony, even from people who have testified to the odd nature of some of this debris, points towards not something extraterrestrial, but towards Project Mogul, which was a very sensitive project. Project Mogul was a top-secret balloon program designed to detect Soviet nuclear activity. Flock believes that it was Mogul balloon debris that Air Force Major Jesse Marcel found at the crash site. He said that he tried to burn it, and it wouldn't burn. He said that it was flexible. Flexibility is a property necessary to, but not exclusive to, weather and surveillance balloons. So it still leaves you with the bodies. But where are the bodies? We have descriptions, yes, of bodies which could be alien bodies. That's a definite possibility, and I want to make that clear. I mean, I'm certainly not excluding that by any stretch of the imagination. But they could also be body, human bodies that have been put through some incredible ordeal. There were bodies there, strange bodies. All of these things clearly indicate we're dealing with a cover-up of something far more important, believe it or not, than the wreckage of a balloon. But, yeah, but you're assuming, you're assuming that the, the, the Army Air Force would not have moved swiftly and pretty decisively to, to keep the wraps on a project like Mogul, which stayed classified until well into the 80s, and, and which there's no question that there, was, there is a Roswell cover-up, or they, in fact, actually probably two Roswell cover-ups. 
one having to do with covering up Mogul, and the other having to do with the issue, whatever it was, involving bodies. those bodies. But I think that this case is important no matter what. I think that we've got something, even if it turns out to be that there are no extraterrestrials involved, nonetheless, something very important happened there. Somebody died, aliens or otherwise, and the government has not come clean on it. There certainly was a cover-up. I think the cover-up's been kept to this day. From a ufological viewpoint, this has become, and I'm a little surprised because I was the original investigator, it's become the case, so to speak. Regardless of what the ultimate outcome turns out to be, it's important no matter what. It's an important issue of government accountability, and it may be an important issue of, of, the, of the future of the human race. The evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. You know, I went out to the site, of, to, to the debris field, as it's come to be known, where, where Rancher Brazel found whatever it was he found. And um, I thought, my God, what, what, must, what must it have been like to see this? Uh, and it's that same kind of feeling. I mean, the idea of holding something in your hand that might have come, you know, across millions, if possibly even billions of miles of space to get here. Recently, the Pentagon released the findings of their comprehensive investigation into the Roswell incident. According to the Secretary of the Air Force, Dr. Sheila E. Widnall, the research, quote, did not locate or develop any information that the Roswell incident was a UFO event. The full report, with all 33 attachments, is available for public review. It's at the Pentagon in the library there, room 1A518. Next, a psychic bond between man and animal saves a life. There is a telepathy that goes on, an empathy that goes on between a person and a pet. Scientifically speaking, our pets have superhuman abilities. They can smell and hear things that we can't. Could then the same be true of an animal's abilities in the paranormal realm? Yes, according to one pet owner in California whose dog had a premonition of danger and saved his life. The unconditional love of a pet is beyond dispute, but is there also a psychic bond between pet and owner? There's scientific proof that dogs truly can tell when something's about to occur. Recently, sightings introduced you to Angie Barnum. Her epileptic seizures were so unpredictable, she was confined to a wheelchair for her own safety. But Angie was liberated by her dog, Sheba, who can sense an impending seizure before it occurs. She paces and whines and jumps on me if I'm not paying attention. She's constant. She always knows. It's a psychic gift this dog has also displayed. Cinder, a pet Rottweiler, is credited with saving the life of her owner because she too sensed impending danger. Ever since I was a little boy, I've always been fond of dogs, and I've always had a dog in my life, and I just feel that they are like people. In May of 1994, Lorenzo's special bond with his pets took on life-saving significance. Lorenzo and I usually go hiking get up to the mountains, and that particular day, I couldn't go with them because I was sick in bed. When I started out the hike, immediately, Cinder was in herself, her normal self. She loves to be the leader of the pack. And, uh, and this time, she immediately wanted just to sit down. And then she'd start off trying to go back down the trail. And then I started thinking, hey, she could be sick. Because of Cinder, the hike was cut short. If it hadn't been, Lorenzo might have died on that trail. I was really surprised because he had come back early. And he just kind of yelled at me from the kitchen and said, you know, I'm back early because Cinder's acting really funny and I think we're gonna have to take her to the vet. And I sit down on the couch and she's just sitting there in front of me, staring at me. And the next thing I know is I start to feel like a little bit of a palpitation. And I looked at Cinder and she had this glazed look on, on her like she's getting sick too. So I thought, well, I better call the vet for her. So I get up and as I go to try and get the phone, the next thing I know is I'm laying there and it's, I'm so weak and I feel this nudging, you know, a cold nose near my hand and uh, there's a phone right there. So I was able to dial 911. She just ended up knowing that he needed that phone and pushed it over to him. Had Cinder sensed Lorenzo's impending heart attack? I think there truly is a fantastic rapport that occurs between people and pets. 
And it's not just a matter of the fact that we're the ones that feed them, take care of them, and house them. There is a telepathy that goes on, an empathy that goes on between a person and a pet. How we can explain it, we can't. When we first arrived at Lorenzo's house, Lorenzo's situation was definitely life-threatening. He was laying flat on his back on his living room floor. He appeared to be in pretty bad shape. And he was in uh, pretty eminent danger of going into cardiac arrest. Rushed to the hospital, Lorenzo had a strange sense of deja vu. Lorenzo is a firefighter who himself has rescued many people in the line of duty. And during one of those rescues, he recalled that paranormal forces seemed to be at work there, too. A building had collapsed on myself and a fellow firefighter. We were both trapped. I had uh, about a minute worth of air left, and I'd pretty much given myself up for dead. Instinct kicked in. Lorenzo rushed into the burning building without his oxygen mask. Although he was recuperating from back surgery, Lorenzo single-handedly lifted a thousand-pound wall engulfed in flames and rescued two fellow officers. What Larry did was nothing short of heroic, lifting that thing off of me and pulling me out of there. Like I said, I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for Larry. In gratitude for saving his life, Mark Eady gave Lorenzo a Rottweiler puppy. Lorenzo and his wife, Roxanne, named the puppy Cinder. When I first heard that Cinder had saved Lorenzo's life, well, you know, words can't express it. it. Everything had come full circle. I said, Mark, you gave me Cinder as a gift for saving your life. And the ironic thing about it is that three years later, she saves my life. She's so special, and um, I just can't imagine ever being without her. Lorenzo Sr. reports that he's back at work fighting fires with the Santa Ana Fire Department. He is taking medication to control his blood pressure, and doctors have given him a clean bill of health. Lorenzo also tells sightings that he has increased Cinder and Reno's daily dose of dog cookies. Coming up, a family mourns her mysterious death, and now a psychic shares a vision of what could have happened. I saw a very mousy-looking man. Then, a legendary ghost is captured on film, and investigating the source of the Taos mystery sound. On previous editions of Sightings, we've featured the work of psychic detective Dorothy Allison. Dorothy believes that she has a supernatural ability to see into a crime scene and pick up where police have left off. In Pennsylvania, a family mourns the death of a sister and a daughter. They know that Dorothy Allison can't bring her back, but maybe she can tell them why Teresa Carlson is gone. We can look out that window and just about see the spot where it happened and not knowing who it was uh, makes it a lot harder. She worried about everybody all the time. And she had real compassion, and she trusted everybody too much, I think. You know, nobody was bad. Everybody was good. Did she die because she trusted too much? No one knows why or even how 28-year-old Teresa Carlson died in September of 1993. All they have is a body and too many questions. Police in Pennsylvania don't have the answers, but Teresa's family is not giving up. Most sisters usually fight and everything. We didn't, we never fought, no. we were always friends. You know, we always looked down for each other. Mary Ann Moeller is still looking out for her sister Teresa. She continues to meet with police detectives, struggling to keep the case alive. With the support of her fiance, Colin Farrell, Mary Ann has decided to turn to a more unorthodox detective, psychic Dorothy Allison. Despite a heavy caseload, Dorothy cannot refuse this call for help. Those little blue eyes and big tears coming out of them, saying, I'd love to know what happened to my sister. I can't rest nights. I get nightmares. I see blood coming off my sister's arms. I see so many bad things. While the results are mixed, police detectives admit that turning to a psychic detective is often a family's last ray of hope in an otherwise unsolvable crime. Well, when you are looking for a solution to a crime and all uh, efforts uh, in traditional means have been exhausted, um, you tend to find people willing to believe certain things in order to come to closure. Arthur Lyons, co-author of The Blue Sense, has researched several psychic detectives and concludes that their use in a dead-end investigation often leads to a reopening of the case. 
We found many policemen willing to consult the psychic simply because they need closure, too, on the cases that they deal with. It was Colin Farrell, a Secret Service agent, who first suggested the use of a psychic in this case. Both he and Mary Ann believed that Teresa brought them together to love each other and to solve her murder. It's something you can't put in the words, but that's why I know, sure as I'm alive, that her sister brought us, had a hand in bringing us together. Teresa wants me to know who did this to her. If through her dreams, she's trying to tell Mary and something. She'd be all, like, bloody and stuff, wearing the same clothes that she was murdered in. I'd see her, and she'd be trying to tell me something, but I couldn't hear her, and I couldn't touch her or anything. And then she was, and after I woke up, I, was re I would realize that she was trying to tell me to turn around and look. That person who did it was behind me, and then that was... I could never stay in a dream long enough to turn around and see. She dreamed the same dream over and over and over again. And that's why, you know, I just, it really started to bother me. I was afraid to go to sleep at night. The facts of the case are scant. On September 5th, 1993, Teresa left her mother's home in Croydon, Pennsylvania, a small town outside of Philadelphia. Her body was found nine days later. It was badly decomposed, making it impossible to determine how why or by whom she'd been killed. Detective Ray Busick heads the investigation. She was found in a wooded area. She was covered with vegetation from that area. Uh, she was nude, lying on her back, clothed only in uh, socks and her sneakers. Teresa was tracked from her residence on September 15th of 1993 in the Croydon area to a pharmacy, several local bars, until the evening hours, like 6 or 7 o'clock in the evening. The police have suspects, but no hard evidence. More than a year after Teresa's death, Dorothy begins her psychic investigation with the police department's cooperation. First, she reviews the facts and talks to the family. I had dreams about her. And what did you dream? Dreams are beautiful. I dreamed that she told me to come in bed and sleep with her. That's wonderful. Once she has touched both emotions and fact, she begins to get psychic impressions of the crime. Whenever I go to a police department, I come with what I think is the clues. It's like looking at television. It, it's as though somebody's reading off something. You're looking at a TV show or a movie, and things are coming gradually. Is there a place called uh, Park Avenue anywhere on yeah. the way to where? I'm getting Park Avenue now. On sound. Okay. There's also a Park Avenue in West Bristol. I'm getting behind a cemetery. Well, I just got that now. She was laying on her back here, her head up in this area, her feet down there. At the scene of the crime, Dorothy was flooded with images of how Teresa died. Police have asked us not to reveal those details. They hit too close to home. But we can show you a composite sketch of a man Dorothy believes witnessed the death. I saw a very mousy looking man and his eyes were so droopy that, that they reminded me of uh, eyes that can't stay open and you know very drawn looking and I felt that his nickname was Needles because he took so many drugs and I feel that he's got a very funny shrill voice. Personally um, I'm a believer uh, there are other uh, people within my department who are non-believers but even the non-believers admit that Dorothy has brought fresh information to the case that they are now following up. In the end, this meeting of minds, the psychic and the scientific, has served at least one very important purpose. It has given solace to Teresa Carlson's family, to her mother, her sister, and the children Teresa never meant to leave behind. I told them that somebody hurt their mom and she died because I just believe in telling them the truth because someday they're going to know it. They take her little papers from school and they talk to her. The baby even sat there and sang a song one day. He said, she can hear me. I know she can hear me. So I think it helps them deal with their grief if they know. Before Dorothy Allison's involvement in the Teresa Carlson case, police investigated several suspects who were later ruled out. But many of Dorothy's clues have police taking another harder look at one of those original suspects. Sightings will bring you an update when and if there's a break in this case.
Next, our strange encounters on a Connecticut road proof that ghosts walk among us. There's no other viable explanation. You know, you're, you're forced to believe. Many people believe that ghosts are manifestations of the dead who sometimes walk among us. If that's true, you would think that the best place to find a ghost is in a cemetery. But after more than 100 ghost investigations, this is the first time Sightings has heard credible reports of a cemetery haunting. And there are photographs and videotape. The road was a little bit damp. And as I was driving, I had a, a sensation. You ever feel like someone's sitting next to you? So I looked over, and there was a, a gentleman as plain and solid as anybody. It wasn't a transparent figure. I looked, saw him, looked forward, looked back, and that figure was gone. When I looked up, that's when I saw the woman in the road. And as soon as I stepped on the brakes, she came from about 40 feet to directly in front of the car. And the thing that sticks in my mind the most is the way her arm came up. It wasn't a stop. It was almost like she was reaching out, not to get me, but reaching out for something. Sightings of a transparent wraith, the lady in white, have been reported near Connecticut's Union Cemetery for more than three decades. I was on call. There was a police officer with me responding to a call of three Transformers uh, blowing up next door to the cemetery. When we got in front of the cemetery, I was looking side to side, and uh, the police officer screamed, watch out. I looked in front of the truck. There was a woman all dressed in white standing in the middle of the road. I applied the brakes. I couldn't stop in time, and I hit her. And the woman went over the hood of the truck and fell back straight back down to the ground. When we jumped out to look, I ran around to the front of the truck to look to see what I had hit. But there was nothing there. There was no blood, no clothing. No, no body, there, there was nothing. We don't know who the white lady is, but she has been witnessed by many people through the years, has been photographed, and her energy's been photographed. Black spirits, or inhuman spirits, seem to not allow her to get the help that she needs in order to pass on correctly. So for that reason, she remains earthbound. Lorraine and Ed Warren are among the world's premier paranormal investigators with more than 46 years of experience in the field. They've studied apparitions in Union Cemetery for nearly a decade. The Warrens have interviewed many witnesses terrified by the lady in white. After the figure went through the car, when I looked up, the road was red, and it wasn't someone's tail lights. There were no cars in front of me. I think the reason that she appeared to him and also the man appeared to him, if we would be in any pain or any anguish, we would go up to someone we felt a great deal of sensitivity from. The spirit would do exactly the same thing. Like attracts like, and the spirits found compassion in a man like him. I was very sad. I, I started crying in my car. Um, I don't know if part of it was nerves that I, I was frightened or if it was just the, uh, the sadness that came over me was in incredible. The sense of sorrow uh, that he felt is, is the compassion that he felt for that particular spirit. That is called radio telethesis, where you feel the pain or the anguish of the particular spirit. The road ahead of him turning that muddy red color was an indication that at that time, Rod was going into their dimension. I didn't tell anybody this story for about two weeks, not even my wife. She was six and a half months pregnant at the time, and I was afraid that whatever this encounter was might have followed me home and in some way affected my unborn child. I had even went as far as um, I had talked to the local police department. I had contacted three area hospitals. Uh, nobody had reported any missing persons, hit and runs, nothing. We know that there were three transformers which had been burning. The electricity had been spewing out into the atmosphere for hours, right near the graveyard. The spirit needs something to physically uh, show itself, to manifest. In this case, he used the electricity, which was very powerful. And the molecular structure of that spirit solidified to the extent that it was almost like cement. And this is what they hit. A sightings investigative team accompanied the Warrens on one of many photographic sessions they've conducted at the graveyard. 
Several local residents have been trained in a special photographic technique developed by the Warrens. Lorraine, a renowned psychic in her own right, pinpoints energy vortices in the cemetery and directs when and where photographs should be taken. You are giving the spirit every opportunity to implant their image onto the film. See, you're not photographing a ghost. The ghost is implanting its image, and the law of attraction is there just as it is in the sightings. There have been people from every walk of life, high school students, college students, police officers, uh, professors, teachers, scientists, who have gone into those two cemeteries, Union and Stephanie, and come out with fantastic psychic pictures. Tantalizing photographs have been taken, but the Warrens have yet to communicate directly with the lady in white. They want to know how she died so they can help her move on. She was human one time. She still has human feelings, but she's very confused. She doesn't realize what's happened to her, and she's trying to find out. Confusion is not the impression left with those who have experienced her firsthand. After what had happened, the, there's no other viable explanation. You know, you're, you're forced to believe. This experience has uh, taken away any doubt in my mind that there is a, a, a life after death, that we're not only on this earth in, in a human form, that after we die, our spirit definitely goes somewhere, whether it stays here or goes beyond. Reports of a mysterious lady in white are common to hauntings in many different cultures. Ghost researchers believe that eyewitnesses are not actually seeing female figures dressed in white. Instead, they are simply putting a name to random collections of visible energy that, so far, have no explanation. Next, a mystery sound in New Mexico is affecting the health of some and forcing others to flee. You're trying to throw her off and then push it away. It's life-threatening. In 1991, several people in Taos, New Mexico, started complaining that a mysterious low-frequency hum was driving them crazy and ruining their lives. Most of their neighbors thought that they were simply hearing things. To them, the Taos hum, as it was dubbed, became the Taos joke. But recently, scientists have proven that there really is a disturbing low-frequency hum emanating from Taos. The problem is they have no idea what's causing it. I've heard of people committing suicide because of it. You're throwing it, trying to throw it off, or you push it away. It's life-threatening. I'm completely stumped what it is. Listen to the hum. A deep, incessant, low-frequency drone. A very deep, deep roar constantly. I hear it now. Now, imagine that you hear it every waking moment of every single day. These frequencies has, have actually caused me to lose my job. Imagine being ridiculed when you finally admit you hear it. Well, I say they're dope-smoking hippies, they have mental problems. Now, imagine your own physician thinking it's a mental problem, too. You wonder, am I crazy? They didn't believe that I was hearing sounds. To more than 1,300 people in Taos, New Mexico, the hum, the ridicule, and the self-doubt is not imaginary. It sounds like a motor running, like a refrigerator running two rooms away, or a diesel truck idling off in the distance. All they can ultimately do is leave. It drives them bonkers. It's like someone scratching their nails on a blackboard. It's obviously quite controversial in Taos because not everybody hears it. But of those who hear it, they're obviously suffering from it, and, and no one could fake a response like that. It wasn't until sensitive instruments actually recorded the Taos hum that sufferers learned they were not alone. At this point, we can't rule out anything as a possible source because we don't know what the source is. Tom Sharp is a reporter for the Albuquerque Journal who has been searching for the source of the Taos hum since 1987. Perhaps something is going on of a large industrial nature in uh, western Utah and for some reason, we are hearing it, or some people are sensing it hundreds, if not thousands, miles away. But many of the victims believe the source of the hum is the U.S. government and that its motives are sinister. I believe that they're using it for mind control. I believe that they're using it for communications. 
and I believe that it's possible that they might be using it for a couple of other things that I'm, I'm not really, I don't really quite have a handle on yet. Well, the RF weapons uh, have become um, maybe the uh, first kinds of non-lethal weapons. Investigative reporter Chuck DeCaro is an expert on radio frequency deployment. He is investigating claims that secret government testing using RF technology is being conducted near Taos. Could engender a cause and effect relationship, much in a way that drugs have a cause and effect relationship. Secret underground bases in the Southwest are not without precedent. Such bases are known to exist in Colorado and Nevada. If a similar type of installation exists in New Mexico, what is its purpose? When we hear from here is what they mention is the possibility of military communications with offshore submarines, um, with other mi military installations, with electromagnetic waves. There have been a lot of studies in the military and other parts of government about effects of radio frequency energy, even at low frequencies, uh, on human behavior and physiology. But the Defense Department insists that RF studies have no relation to the Taos hum. Congress claims to be as puzzled about the hum as anyone and is cooperating fully with an ongoing investigation by the University of New Mexico. There are people out there who are sensing something which is extremely disturbing to them. Uh, many of them make them ill enough they've left the area. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, something needs to be done about it. But so far, the university team's findings have been inconclusive. Unfortunately, we didn't find uh, anything that we could pin down as the cause of the hum. But some people believe that the university team will never find the source of the hum because the government is hiding what it really knows. The Defense Department, they know what it is. I do not understand why they're not telling us what it is. Despite these claims, the University of New Mexico continues to study the Taos hum and its possible source. The University of New Mexico has had to design and build equipment that will test the responses of these people to very low frequencies. And equipment like this has never existed before, so that's been the difficult part of the research so far. While the team tries to invent new mechanisms for detecting the hum's source, sufferers in Taos are becoming more desperate. I feel like I'm a victim of something that I cannot stop. They cannot stop, and there's nothing we can do. Taos isn't the only American town that's humming. Recently, divers in Monterey, California, experienced an underwater hum so strong that they felt the vibration in their lungs. The Monterey hum, actually more of a thump, according to divers, has no discernible source. Tapes of the noise are now being analyzed by underwater acoustics experts. Their initial response is that the noise is mechanical, but remind us that the ocean contains many secrets yet to be revealed. Sightings has expanded its America Online area. Keyword sightings when you log on for access to sightings, stories, images, and events. To subscribe to America Online, call 1-800-591-3344. And you can still reach sightings 24 hours a day at 1-900-933-7444. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, Dark Shadows. The government's ultimate concealed weapon, The Invisible Man, a Sci-Fi original series. Disappearing Fridays at 8 on Sci-Fi.